Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton of Multipolarista, and I'm joined by my good friend Aaron Good, great historian and political economist. He's the author of the book American Exception, Empire and the Deep State, and I have a series here that I co-produce with his podcast, the American Exception podcast, focusing on the history of the U.S. empire and deep state. But today we're doing a slightly different episode, and we're going to talk about Francis Fukuyama. He's this neoliberal sophist. He's a world-renowned political scientist. He's very well known for writing a book in 1992, which ended up being completely debunked, but at the time it was very influential, called The End of History and the Last Man. And he argued that after the overthrow of the Soviet Union and the end of the first Cold War, it was the end of history. Liberal democracy, capitalism, and you know this neoliberal phase of capitalism was the end of history. Every country around the world was going to a going to create some kind of Western style liberal capitalist democracy. And that was the end of human revolution. And of course, he was completely wrong about that. History has continued to move on. And especially in the past few years, history is, is changing very rapidly. The world is changing very rapidly. But um, the latest is that Francis Fukuyama has now made it his intellectual mission to defend the deep state. <laughs> and that's why I, when I saw these series, this new series that Francis Fukuyama is writing, I knew I had to bring on Aaron to talk about this. So Francis Fukuyama has a website called American Purpose. This is a kind of like neoconservative magazine defending the US empire, defending you know liberalism and capitalism. And Francis Fukuyama is the chair of the editorial board of this website, American Purpose. And he recently, this, September started a new series called Valuing the Deep State. And right now, today is September 16th. So right now there's only two parts that have been published. So we're, what we're probably going to do is respond to this in two different episodes. We're going to introduce it now. And then when he finishes publishing the entire series, we'll do a follow up. But today we just wanted to uh, provide a, a basic kind of analysis and background of Francis Fukuyama and this new series he has, Valuing the Deep State. So I'll, I'll let you jump in here, Aaron. It's just funny. My, my first thought when I saw this is we're constantly told by mainstream bourgeois political scientists, people like Francis Fukuyama, that the deep state doesn't exist. It's like a conspiracy theory to talk about the deep state. But at the same time, they're like, well, yeah. And if it does exist, it's justified and it's good. And here's a long series about why it's good. Yeah, that part's a little strange. He's not the first one of his cohort to overtly kind of say like, hey, the deep state is, is cool. I think Bill Crystal wrote something to that effect, <laughs> maybe on Twitter, where he said like, if there is a deep state and it's like going to protect us from the excesses of Trump, then, you know, I'm all for it. So uh, this is uh, this is a this is not he's not the first guy to do this, but he is someone who's a little more careful and more scholarly than like Bill Crystal, who's just more of a, you know, imperialist um, you know, promoter of imperialism and conservatism in general. Fukuyama was originally kind of a neoconservative. I mean, he, he was a signatory to the Project for a New American Century, um, which is interesting that he would put that out after writing The End of History, which where he said that with the end of the Cold War, you essentially had the triumph of liberal democracy, and this was going to be uh, the end of history, neoliberal capitalism overseen by benevolent U.S. You know, hegemony is uh, it, it is represents sort of like some sort of Star Trek future, I guess, for the world. But of course, it didn't come to pass uh, that way. And um, so it's it's and he later disavowed that, by the way, he later said, I don't support this neoconservative project anymore. But even that project is weird because it's like they've kind of folded up their tent in the normal way and they've kind of, but they're still there. That mindset is still in the, in the, in the U S empire uh, completely. Like it's just, you had Bush's global war on terror, Obama takes over and he it continues those to go down that litany of countries that, that were to be invaded by the neocons, you know, like um, uh, they wanted to go after Iran uh, Syria, Libya, and so on. And Obama uses the Arab Spring to go to launch wars in Libya and Syria, and also operations in Iran that they've tried to do little color revolutions that have kind of fizzled out. So the, the neoconservative thing, it has 
not really faded away. It's just more been subsumed into the the zeitgeist of the American foreign policy blob. And there's really been no no change. If anything, they're even more invested in trying to uh, extend American unipolarity forever. So that's what, what this guy represents. He, he represents the sort of sober academic side of the American unipolar project. Yeah. And what's funny about this series, we're, we'll, we'll go into more detail in a, in a bit here, but in part two of this series, valuing the deep state, he kind of just gets, a, he has a throwaway line here where he talks about my mentor, Samuel Huntington. And this is another very revealing moment. You talked about how Francis Fukuyama had originally been identified with neoconservatism, although he did distance himself from the neoconservative movement. But Samuel Huntington is someone who can be seen as, in some ways, kind of a godfather of that movement. This is a, a guy who's probably most well known for his book, The Clash of Civilizations, where he tried to portray political and economic conflicts not as rooted in material contradictions and you know, fights over resources and, and labor and, you know, geopolitical struggles and trade routes. Instead, it was about culture. It was a clash of civilization. And specifically, this was to justify a lot of these interventionist policies in the Middle East and West Asia, basically saying that, you know, like these Muslim hordes are undemocratic through their culture and all of this. So I'm wondering what you think about the fact that Fukuyama, this, this you know, lover of liberal democracy, who's who's made it his his crusade in life to defend liberal democracy, casually acknowledging the fact that his mentor is Samuel Huntington. Yeah, I mean, it's it, uh, it, it's something I don't even know if I knew before that he had been that he was an acolyte of, of Huntington. Uh, ironically, my my own dissertation, it, it, uh, the guy who was the chair on my dissertation committee, he took classes under Sam Huntington at Harvard. And um, but he, you know, he's not of that same that same bent, but he was, you know, he, so Sam Huntington has influenced a lot of people. But in, in Fukuyama's case, he is very um, it's important. It's, it's important to notice that he is a, a, a guy who was a mentor to, to Fukuyama because Huntington's career, if you look at him, he is like one of these intellectuals, these political scientists whose work it always comes along to say what you could imagine the Americans, the U S establishment would want an academic to say. So in the late 1960s, he wrote this book called political order in changing societies that gets assigned uh, to punish all people who take comparative politics in graduate school. <laughs> and this is a book that's written uh, in the, I think it's in like 1968 or so that it comes out. And this is after Johnson administration has taken over. And some of the promises or the hopes of uh, the people who wanted mo to push modernization theory in the developing world were uh, kind of dashed because of events like, you know, coups and overthrows of democracy in the third world and other problems that they had. And so Huntington writes about this in 1968 and writes about how the military is probably the best institution to oversee modernization in general in these areas, but that if modernization and democracy uh, are too destabilizing to the status quo, then the military sometimes intervenes and exercises a veto coup in places like Iran and Indonesia and so on. And he, so he mentions these places where such things happen, where there are coups, but he totally omits the U.S. role, which wasn't known at the time, but he was a consultant for the CIA. He may have been aware of these things, and there were certainly those things were certainly talked about up to this point. There were some exposés on the CIA by that time. So he could have put this in the book, but he omits it entirely. He omits U.S. imperialism entirely. And so it contributes to people studying comparative politics in the United States, which is studying political systems across countries, you know, and, and regions. Uh, he, he puts forward a way of doing this that totally omits imperialism, which for these countries is an overriding thing. Instead, it's all turned into like a look at their domestic politics as though covert operations and such never happen. And as though there's not overriding support, external support to oppressive institutions in these countries. Okay. So this is like where he's putting out scholarship that is kind of, uh, it, I don't, there's not even really a word for this in, uh, in, academia i don't think there needs to be it's like a, a, a scholarship uh, especially in social science that is not 
formulated to actually illuminate the subjects it's supposed to be, you know, discussing or exploring, but really is a way of, 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 of theorizing about the social world that is agreeable to existing power structures. Okay. It's like, it's not just propaganda. It's like something even deeper than that, but he, th that is what Huntington did. And then later in the seventies, he was a part of the Carter administration um, and he was with the Trilateral Commission in the early seven, 1970s, too. So here you have this establishment entity of oil and fi uh, finance, you know, enormous amounts of money headed by Rockefeller and Rockefeller Group. And it brings together people like Brzezinski and Huntington. And they write uh, books like um, The Crisis of Democracy. I think Huntington is one of the main authors. He's the main American author of that one, as I recall. And there's a Japanese and a European author as well for a part of that. But that was just a study that was saying... Uh, there's too much democracy in the United States. There's a crisis of authority and democracy works best when certain groups are pretty much kept out of the mainstream for a long time, even though it's not totally fair and democratic, like black people, for example. So Huntington was writing these sort of things and he's just putting out like exactly what the establishment wants to hear. And so in, in scholarly terms, it's like he, you know, who pays the piper, right? Whoever pays the piper calls the tune. And that's what ends up happening in academia a lot of the time. And Sam Huntington represented that. It, later, when you have the move in the eight, eight, late 80s, early 90s towards uh, democracy promotion, okay, which is safer to pursue at this time because the uh, Washington consensus is so powerful and economic financial methods of control over these countries are so powerful that like it does if they can have democracy and it's not really threatening to u.s interests right um because u.s power is so strong so the u.s promotes democracy with the national endowment for democracy and other institutions and sam huntington writes about this calling it the wave of democracy and trying to explain democracy and how it comes in waves and this is uh, leading to a good sort of happy future so in a way huntington and fukuyama both have this liberal telos is liberal I, uh, teleology where you have human progress moving towards neoliberal uh liberal neoliberal democracy neoliberalism and liberal democracy and this is this is going to be awesome and huntington goes on to write later uh, after the waves of democracy stuff which is also again very useful to the establishment just like political order and changing societies just like his work with the trilateral commission he goes on to write the clash of civilizations which is He's not a not he's not a neocon in a way, just sort of like Fukuyama is not a neocon, but then he is a neocon because the neocons are kind of everybody in the U.S. foreign policy establishment. Like Brzezinski's not a neocon exactly. He's known to like be sort of against these people in some issues, but like he's the guy that came up with the arc of crisis plan to use Muslims in the Middle East to start to attack the Soviet Union and so on. So there's very little difference between the people who we would say are full on neocons and then sort of liberal realists. I guess Fukuyama is the kind of test case in this because he's been like a neocon, but then he's like, oh, I'm not a neocon. But like the, his changes in thinking are not really radical. He's not become an anti-establishment kind of person. He's just sort of shifted from one camp to the other, but he's totally dedicated to U.S. hegemony. So when Huntington writes Clash of Civilizations, this is this is the one you were speaking about where he is saying that the main issues are no longer about like economic systems and ideology like they were during the cold war the new conflicts are going to be about civilizational differences and he points to china and islam i think as the more significant ones and i think that there's some with russia too but i don't remember exactly how he deals with it there's first an article on this in foreign affairs and then it, he turns it into a book but uh this is of course gearing up for the the war on terror that's coming up and so on. This is kind of like where the, the U S establishment is going and Huntington was out there ahead of it, you know, uh, at the time. And this is sort of helping to seed the discourse for, uh, for when the time, when the time comes, when you have reasons for the U S to go and get more involved in these areas, like Sam Huntington becomes really talked about, especially after nine 11. Um, and so Fukuyama is, the fact that he would be an acolyte of Huntington really says a lot because it, it shows you how his career is very much attuned to going to where the establishment wants uh, scholars to go. And so he gets to be, in, you know, get appointments at great institutions like Huntington from Harvard. 
Huntington was a came from an old family, like a Mayflower family or something like that. Like this is a American, uh, a, a white American <laughs> dude from, from who was like there at the origin or the creation, or at least his ancestors were. So uh, Fukuyama obviously is uh, of Japanese uh, extraction, but you know um, he's the Borg is more the foreign policy imperial Borg is more inclusive these days. Well, yeah. And of course, the Trilateral Commission, the reason it's called that is the trilateral element is the US, Europe and Japan. And that used to be referred to by anti-imperialists and especially economists like Samir Amin, one of the greatest Marxist anti-imperialist economists. They they used to refer to that as the triad and largely because of the uh, like the Kyoto Accords and like basically the kind of big bubble in the Japanese economy in the 1980s, the asset inflation bubble, Japan has never really economically recovered, largely because the U.S. kind of like partially waged war on Japan's economy. So Japan no longer represents that same kind of economic role that it used to play before. But that the Trilateral Commission in the 1970s, that was those were the three major hegemonic blocks that were dominating the world with you know three capitalist economies the US Europe and Japan and i think that that essay or book that you mention the crisis of democracy is so important to keep in mind because it shows how it and every, every you know every decade at every different kind of watershed moment in history when the political the the direction of the wind political wind is changing you can see people like fukuyama and huntington kind of change their tune a little bit and what's funny is now we'll we'll go, we'll go back to the series that fukuyama is writing honoring and praising the deep state. And back in the 70s, we saw that Huntington was warning and, and others in Trilateral Commission, again, created by Rockefeller, funded by, you know, big capitalist oligarch money. They were warning there was too much democracy in response to the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the anti-war movement. There was a crisis of democracy being too much democracy. And now we're in a moment where Fukuyama says, Trump poses this existential threat, therefore, Trump attacks the deep state, but the deep state's good because the deep state is going to hold back people like Trump. And I, before, we should talk about a few things in, in this article series. But before that, I just want to show the masthead of this magazine where Francis Fukuyama is the chairman. It's called American Purpose. And they make it very clear what their goal is as an institution. They say they exist to defend and promote liberal democracy and they claim they they lament that liberal democracy has come under attack on both the right and the left. And they also say their other goal is to strengthen U.S. hegemony and imperialism. They, they, they say, as the United States has stepped back from its longstanding role as leader of the world's liberal democracies, we have seen liberal democracy threatened by both authoritarian regimes and populist governments. This is something that Fukuyama has been really just ringing the alarm bell about a lot, saying that populism threatens democracy, populism, populism. They always use that term populism, of course, because it's it's very uh, ambiguous. It's kind of inchoate concept. It's never clearly defined, but- I think it's more or less synonymous with, in their usage of it, it's a st it's a synonymous with anti-establishmentism or anti-establishmentarianism, whatever you want to call it. Like, Cause it's basically like people who are anti-establishment on the right or left, and that somehow they're the same. So we're just going to give them a name so that it's a it's more or less a way to gas up the establishment. If you're just if you've got a name to call everybody who's anti-establishment and say, that, oh, that's a thing and that's a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, there's been a kind of center right neoliberal uh, orthodoxy that's been completely bipartisan since the 1980s, unchallenged since the 1980s in both the U.S. and Europe. And if you challenge that center right neoliberal orthodoxy, if you challenge it from the left or from the far right, they say you're a populist and therefore you're the same. So someone like Bernie Sanders, who's a center left social Democrat, he's seen as this radical figure because he's challenging the center right establishment, you know, political orthodoxy. And then, of course, you have the far right Trump phenomenon, Viktor Orban, those people, Marine Le Pen, they're challenging the center right establishment from even further right. So. To, to these figures like Fukuyama, that's all just populism and it's dangerous. And of course, it, it involves too much popular enthusiasm 
you, you should have democracy, but only have elections every four years. And then people should just go home and stop participating. That's basically their, their worldview. And, and if you look back at this website, they also throw in there that they talk about cultural issues. I mean, whatever. But if you look at the editorial board, it's funny. I went through and looked at these names and it really is like a who's who of neoconservatives and liberal interventionists in Washington. Now, we were talking about this earlier. Neoconservatism can mean several different things. And in some ways, it's actually pretty s similar to even synonymous with liberal interventionism. You have people like Samantha Power, for instance, who would not call herself a conservative, certainly, or neoconservative. But in terms of her foreign policy, she's absolutely on board with the same kinds of policies as the neocons, the same wars. Hillary Clinton's another example. So basically, this this institution, which is this website, American Purpose, hilarious name, it brings together all of these neocons and liberal interventionists. So you have the chairs, Francis Fukuyama, Elliot Cohen, who worked in the State Department under Condoleezza Rice in the Bush administration. He was involved in helping plan Iraq war efforts. You have Michael McFaul, who's an Obama guy. He was Obama's ambassador to Russia and has become one of the main, you know, anti-Russia hawks. There's so many people on this mass that I don't even know who a lot of these people are. They're just all these like hawks in Washington. There's this guy, Hal Brands, who is the Henry Kissinger Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins University. And he is a former Pentagon official and he's a main, a major neocon, especially like on the, in the war, proxy war in Ukraine. He's been really pushing aggressively. Shadi Hamid is this, like this Brookings Institution guy who is like this, I mean, they, the, the imperialist establishment use him as like a, to, a token Muslim who defends U.S. imperialism. And he's been, he was like one of the main cheerleaders for the war in Libya. Like Shadi Hamid like, has written all these articles praising the NATO war that destroyed Libya. You also have Jamie Kirchik or James Kirchik, who is oh another God. neocon. You know, he uses like uh, LGBT rights to, to try to like demonize any country that's a target of U.S. imperialism and say that like the U.S. should invade them and destroy their government. So, I mean, it's all these neocons and liberal interventionists. I mean, and of course, Fukuyama is the head of this. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that before we go to the article itself. No, it just is, you know, it's a it's a they have some. Uh, pluralism there. There's some diversity in those in their in their establishment friendliness. Uh, Eikenberry was one name I noticed on there, who's a IR guy, and who was uh, who as mainstream IR guys go is like there's there's way worse people than him, but he's of course still kind of got the you know you've got to keep one foot in the liberal establishment camp at all at all times, and so he adheres to that. So it's basically you're not going to have anybody there who disagrees with the fundamentals of um, U.S privacy uber always you know as the guide as the lodestar of of what america ought to be doing <laughs> yeah uh, i was thinking of the dead kennedy song california uber always but uh u.s hegemony over always is, is good um all right so there's there are only two parts of the series and i wanted to give an introduction for people who don't know francis fukuyama so let's just briefly here kind of respond um to these these two articles here on valuing the deep state and um, I have some thoughts here, Aaron, and then I'll let you jump in. It's funny. I, I think what, what we're seeing here with this series is a few things. First of all, what we see is this intellectual sleight of hand where, of course, people like Fukuyama, people, this kind of these, you know, uh, mainstream centrist or center right intellectuals, they have often argued that there is no deep state. And We've, we've talked in our series, Aaron, about how Donald Trump has kind of distorted the concept of the deep state. He did popularize it. He didn't create it. People have been talking about the deep state, including mainstream established scholars for many years, especially going back to the Turkish deep state, which was largely a product of NATO and Operation Gladio and all of that. But so Trump has kind of distorted and popularized this concept of the deep state, which led a lot of these kind of neoliberal intellectuals to argue that there is no deep state. But now... They recognize that, you know, Trump poses this great threat to democracy. And, you know, of course, the U.S. is not a democracy. But you could say that definitely Trump poses a threat to the established neoliberal institutions as they exist by, I mean, he he did openly try to overturn the election results. I mean, that that is pretty incredible, like a sitting U.S. president refusing to recognize that he lost the election 
encouraging his supporters to storm the Capitol and all of that. So, I mean, for, for these centrist establishment uh, intellectuals, they see this as this grave threat. So now they've changed their tune and said, well, the deep state actually does exist, but it's good. And what, what he does in this series is he tries to argue that societies that don't have strong states, he gives the example of Iraq and Afghanistan, where the U.S. military destroyed their states. Those are societies that are in chaos. And, and he said that he learned from seeing those societies that you need a strong state to have a functioning society. So what he does is he basically keeps this very vague definition of state. And he doesn't even use the term deep state a lot. He prefers talking about the concept of the modern state or the impersonal state. He says we need an impersonal state. And he emphasizes that this impersonal state needs autonomy. That is to say, it needs to be independent from the elected leadership. That is to say that it needs to be autonomous from the people. The people cannot have too much control over the state or it'll be so-called populism. And he criticizes so-called left-wing and right-wing populism. So basically he's saying that these societies with failed states need a strong state. Therefore, in the United States, we need a stronger deep state by conflating the concept of the state with the concept of the deep state and, and not really distinguishing the two. I think yeah. that's what he's doing here. It's an intellectual sleight of hand. And he's a smart guy. I think he knows what he's doing. He's just basically trying to make the deep state sound more appealing in order to basically say, I support liberal democracy, but we need to actually curtail democracy. Right. He, he's he I'm going to let I want to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here because it's an ongoing series. And in some ways, he hasn't gotten too far into what he's purporting to be exploring, which is the idea of the deep state. As you point out, he does essentially use the deep state as a synonym for the state, which is so he's not engaging with the scholarship behind the deep state at all. It's it, it, thus far in the piece. And, and he's left himself room that he could go back and revisit this, which I, I hope he does because I'd like to see it. Um, he, he doesn't unpack what the deep state really is. He talks about the state and Max Weber's definition of the state, even though he doesn't list it, which it's not very long. So he could just say, yeah, it's that it, that organization which maintains a monopoly on the organized use of violence uh, in the legitimate use of violence in a in a in a spatial territory, right, in an area. So it's that that organization that is has control, political control over a particular area. But that in that that's not what we're really talking about with the deep state. We're talking about something else, and the deep state is something that matters mostly in terms of a democracy because it's saying that there is an autocratic state in that is that it marches alongside this more open state okay or in the my, my formulation of it is that you have a security state which is which does have some degree of secrecy and hierarchically hierarchical organization maybe not totally open and democratic uh, along with the democratic state but that it's really there's the, there are these other powers that are that, that that are responsible for governance and are not really a part of what you would call the public state or even the security state that there's more going on there so he's not looking at that he's talking about the permanent or the bureaucracy more or less and he's saying that your state needs a bureaucracy that's like meritorious right well first of all if you're talking about the civil service in the united states that's one aspect of the state um which is worth noting, and it could be theorized about how exactly you should organize something like that. But as C. Wright Mills pointed out in the 1950s in, in The Power Elite, he pointed out that one of the main problems with the U.S. political system and the reason that the, the wealthy and the elites in America have been able to override democracy is that there never really was a great civil service in the United States vested with authority and, and judged by merit. And that really is the case up to the present day. Even the places that do have, I mean, I, I'm not the expert on all, on all the places where these things are applied. So take this with a grain of salt. But even in the organizations where there are uh, in things like entrance exams, something analogous to the Confucian system that he uh, praises here in this piece, with, with good reason. It's an interesting thing, but I, I can talk more about that later. But he, the State Department, for example, they have an entrance exam. You take it 
right? And you fill, it's multiple choice. And it's just basically to decide like, okay, are you a person who knows a lot about the world and politics and history to where like you could potentially work for the US State Department? But if you pass that, then you go and take an oral exam. Now, I actually took this years ago and I passed that. And then I took the oral interview portion of it where you're there with a bunch of people doing a bunch of contrived exercises. And I did not pass that stage of it. And, uh, but when you, ha but that one, that part is so subjective that it's, I, I have to think that they're looking more for like sort of uh, corporate compatibility sort of characteristics. And so even that is like, how do you, how, how can you even say that this is like something that is, ultimately based on a sort of dispassionate and objective, um, you know, idea of, of merit and skills rather than like sort of looking for people who are good political fits, right? So we don't have much of a, of a civil service to begin with, but that's not really what we've been talking about when we're talking about the deep state anyway. You're talking about a different kind of, of anti-democratic power. So when he's talking about liberal democracy and the state, the the problem with the deep state is that it is the problem with liberal democracy that it is illiberal and anti-democratic okay that it is uh, an expression of oligarchic power that constrains freedom which is to say it is illiberal illiberal <laughs> so this is and this is uh not something he wants to grapple with and in u.s history of course when the empire takes over after world war ii that's when deep political power is most obvious because it just steers the U.S. on this imperial course. But you can see deep political power in other episodes in U.S. history, like, for example, the uh, decision to apply the 14th Amendment to corporations. OK, this is not something that derived out of legal logic in any sensible way. It's not something that came from uh, democracy and elected officials reflecting the will of the public. This is top down oligarchic power. OK, and so people like Fukuyama can't say that, like, the Supreme Court's autonomy is somehow uh, for the good of the public. You know, this is uh, he's he's trying to deny this sort of top down power by kind of writing it out of his equation to begin with. So you're just like, do you want a state or do you not want a state is how he's trying. He's presenting it thus far in these two articles. Now, we'll see if he goes further with this, but I would guess he's not going to enter to engage too much with the deep state theorists because a there's not that many of them in academia and uh they would seem to complicate his his argument so i would guess um, but i could be wrong and i hope i'm wrong that he will not really grapple with them there's there's another funny intellectual sleight of hand that he does in this article where he keeps comparing formerly colonized countries with very low levels of economic development that have weak states and then basically kind of comparing them to these imperialist countries in the in the imperial core, like in the US and Europe that have very developed economies and very sophisticated states. And there is a very revealing moment in this where he talks about his experience working with the World Bank and an Australian aid agency in the mid 2000s to look at state building efforts in Papua New Guinea, East Timor and the Solomon Islands. These are three very poor, uh, underdeveloped areas. And of course, what he doesn't mention is that East Timor was invaded and occupied by the Indonesian military dictatorship of Suharto, backed by the West. And the Suharto dictatorship basically carried out genocide, killing uh, like one third of the population of East Timor. And the Solomon Islands has now become this kind of like major geopolitical hot potato in the new Cold War. It just signed a security agreement with China and Australia has been like militarily threatening the Solomon Islands. A bunch of neocons in Washington have been threatening potential like military action to prevent them from, to prevent China from like having a military alliance. And what, what he, he also talks about failed states in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Sierra Leone and Liberia. So, what he's talking about is areas of the world that have been ravaged by imperialism. Bosnia is another example. I mean, we obviously everyone knows Afghanistan was was, you know, ravaged ravaged by 20 years of US NATO military occupation, but Bosnia too. What happened in Bosnia? The NATO waged a war that destroyed Yugoslavia in the 1990s. So he's like he's showing as an example these areas of the world that have been ravaged by imperialist war and exploitation and occupation that have very weak or no states at all. And saying that like, this is an example of why we need to strengthen the state and ipso facto by logic also strengthen the deep state. 
And again, he keeps referring to the idea. He repeats this concept. He refers to it as a modern state. He doesn't, he doesn't define what a modern state means. What's a mo how does a modern state differ from a pre-modern state? And then he also refers to it as an impersonal state. That's a little clearer what he means by that. Impersonal with autonomy. So uh, that is to say not accountable to democratic uh, will. But in the second part, this is where you kind of hinted that he takes a kind of different argument. It's funny, he's like kind of playing around with his, with his intellectual arguments here. The second part of the series, he tries to apply this kind of like evolutionary perspective on the state. He talks about evolutionary biology, comparative anthropology, and social psychology. And he basically goes through a very brief history of the emergence of the state. And he talks about evolutionary jumps from pre from uh, you know, pre-civilizational states in like early China and Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt coming up to the creation of modern states. He talks about the Qin dynasty in China. And basically his implication, at least so far in the series, is that just as liberal democracy and neoliberal capitalism was this kind of like peak of human development, the last stage of human development, he's basically kind of hinting at the, the emergence of an impersonal autonomous state, that is what he's saying as a deep state, is this like evolutionary development. It's this tele teleological development. So we went from, you know, hunter and gatherers and tribal societies and developed like this pre-civilizational state and then a kind of modern state. And that's and then that moves, it progresses toward what we have now with this, this bureaucratic, unaccountable, autonomous deep state. It seems to me that's his argument there. And Anytime I see a political scientist talk about human nature, and this in the second part, he quite literally, he says, the starting point for my approach was to take human nature seriously. So anytime I see a political scientist talk about human nature and evolutionary biology, I immediately am suspicious of what they're, they're trying to argue. I, I'm curious yeah, what you think about his argument. He's a little better than some of them. I mean, the problem is with human nature is that it's hard to disentangle it from social um, social influences. So you need to, you're, if you're going to formulate some kind of political theory or some political ideas, you're, you're going to need to have some concept of like what human beings really are by by nature and then how society and social influence, you know, social influences and civilization can you know, maybe alter these in ways that might be good for, you know, humanity as a whole, yada, yada. But in, you know, in his case, you're right to be a little, to, to wonder where he's going to go with all of that. He points out that in a, in previous decades, political scientists and economists were more interested in looking at rational choice ideas and everybody has these self-interested utility maximizers, you know, and that he at least has the wherewithal to point out like that this was a huge problem even though it may have influenced his sad you know that should have been his downfall with writing the end of history but it wasn't um but his some of the other things he writes about the history here are not they're they're interesting and they're important to bring up in terms of discussing actual the, the state in general and what the state is so when he t he talks about charles tilly and he brings up how, how Charles Tilly said that in, Tar, Charles Tilly's talking about the year, the modern European state and how it emerges because of war and that these entities become very good at organizing in a particular way uh, for war. And because they are effective, then other states have to copy them or they'll just get destroyed by this sort of level of organization. And this is, this is important to point out. And I think it's it, that Tilly was very good on these issues What's interesting is that Fukuyama leaves out other parts of Tilly's analysis of the state, which is that the state, as it did emerge, was essentially a gangster enterprise. It was protection rackets and that this is how it developed alongside capitalism and that this these people resembled nothing as much as roving bandits and that they were good at war making and that they would threaten people to join them and then, uh, you know, submit to the authority of the of the state which with that, at that point in its early stages was, was more like a protection racket than like what the actual state is now, and that that's how they really organized it uh, themselves. And this points to the sort of gangster element uh, of, of capitalism as an exploitative enterprise, and then the state as, a, as an exploitative 
often exploitative enterprise that goes that, that that develops alongside of it, even as it also does useful things. So this is really the the contradiction of civilization that it is worth looking at more and, and thinking about in these terms. It's like the state is something that arises in part, in considerable part, to justify the hierarchies of inequality in a, in a more complex society, okay, that, that hunter-gatherer societies develop into sedentary societies with farming and agriculture, and they develop civilization in ways that are pretty much along the lines of what you learn about in anthropology classes, okay, and that, but that in order to do so, they have to have this sovereign uh, to justify and maintain the, the rules uh, and the hierarchies that exist in these in these entities, and the hierarchies are unfortunately essential for the development of civilization. That you have to have exploitation of people in order to be able to allow other people to have a division of labor and do other things like that would advance technology and and human knowledge and so on, and to create a, a state, a coercive apparatus to defend itself from outside threats and to allow for expansion, and also to police the hierarchy within the state or within the civilization. Okay, so this means that there's a coercive shitty side to the human civilization, which is based on exploitation and is, and is immoral. And yet every advancement that we have that we could, would like and appreciate and things like the enlightenment and, you know, arts and everything else uh, are the product of a kind of exploitative and immoral system. Okay, this is the fundamental contradiction of our of, of human civilization and he pretty much a lot doesn't mention that part he just talks about like the need for he's not ambivalent about it it's more just like you need a state and the state will allow for better economic development and uh human and, and progress which is that part is is true but it's also it, it empowers people and it creates you know opportunities for people to to abuse the power of the state and that's you know, he wants to talk about China and the Qin Dynasty and so on, but look at what happens to the Qin Dynasty with this power that once they reunite China after the Warring States period, they don't last very long. And he mentions that the Han Dynasty comes along and they sort of soften the edges of it, uh, and, and then it's able to adapt this uh, state to a dynasty that's more long-lasting. Okay, and it legitimizes itself with Confucianism rather than just the legalism of the Qin Dynasty, which is something else he could look at, which is pretty interesting. It was a state of war uh, that led to the development of the Qin Dynasty, which and Qin was just one state in the Warring State period, and they had this whole philosophy called legalism, which was totally crazy, uh, where it was like you had the strictest everything was circumscribed and rules for every person in in different positions within the state, and it, there were very harsh punishments if you dis if you differed from these rules or if you violated them. There's one reading that I used to assign to Chinese history students where. Uh, it's a guy, a legalist scholar under the Qin Dynasty, and he's writing a, a, par a story about how the, the emperor has this guy who's like the keeper of the hat and the keeper of the blanket. And the keeper of the blanket had gone to bed, and the keeper of the hat saw that the emperor was cold and sleeping somewhere, and he might get sick. So the keeper of the hat puts a blanket on the emperor, uh, but that's against the rules because that's supposed to be the job of the keeper of the blanket. And so the emperor is wakes up and he's happy to have the blanket, but he realizes that the law has been broken and he must punish the keeper of the hat, <laughs> right? This is like, this is the mentality that they had there. And it was very harsh. If you did bad things, they'd give you the five punishments, okay? They tattoo you, cut off your nose, castrate you, cut off your arms, and then flay you to death, right? This is a pretty harsh, that's a pretty harsh system. The guy that invented it, this guy named Li Shi, who invented that punishment, he was so conspiratorial uh, that later he tries to hatch this plot with some eunuchs and he tricks the emperor's son into killing himself and the whole conspiracy comes unraveled and the guy that invented the five punishments gets put to death with the five punishments, okay? And that's near the end of that dynasty. So this the state is, the this is a longer way of, of saying that the, the state and the power of the state has never been like impersonal and it, it carries with it a lot of... Uh, opportunities for brutality and uh, top-down dominance. And so the, issue, the, the role of the state, and especially a permanent state in a democracy, is, is quite a serious thing uh, that, that needs more exploration. And so far, he's, he's not gone there, but 
it, it'll be interesting to see where he goes with this further. I really want to see if he wants to engage with the deep state or if the deep state is just a prop for him to really just talk about the state and why you need a state. Yeah, and I think he's, I mean, that's that's a really funny point about the Qin Dynasty. And of course, he he very much euphemizes a lot of that history. But I think he's also doing something simultaneously, at least in the, in the second part of this, he's obliquely acknowledging that neoliberalism has failed. And we've, we've seen hints of this from, you know, these elite bourgeois institutions going on for a few years now. Uh, I think especially it reminded me of this report that was published by economists at the IMF in 2016, and it was called neoliberalism oversold question mark. And they acknowledged that neoliberalism had failed to create economic growth had created more inequality and more economic instability and trapped countries in debt. All the things that left-wing critics of neoliberal capitalism had said for many decades, they were acknowledging that. And in this article here, Fukuyama, who of course had written paeans to how great neoliberalism was. I mean, in the 1990s, that was his civilizational mission. But he is now kind of revising that, that argument and acknowledging that the countries that had economic development were countries where they had some kind of state leadership in the economy. Now, of course, he doesn't engage with the Chinese model at all. He talks about China, Japan, and in South Korea all together as if they have the same economic model. I mean, China quite literally still has five-year plans, right? Like it has five-year plans of economic development. It's lifted over 800 million people out of poverty. But this, I think this is a money passage here. It's really interesting. He acknowledges that economic modernization everywhere in the world has depended on the emergence of states, and in particular, modern states that could impartially protect property rights and adjudicate disputes. He, of course, constantly stresses the importance of protecting property rights. I mean, he still is this you know, uh, capitalist at heart. But he acknowledges here, this is a very interesting quote. He says, during the neoliberal 1980s and 90s, Many economists believe the state itself was the primary obstacle to economic growth and markets would spontaneously appear and sustain themselves. They failed to recognize that no modern economy can thrive without a coherent state to provide order and security and beyond that to provide a stable, fr stable framework of property rights and public services. He, he repeats property rights two times in two paragraphs. He just keeps hitting that point. Because he, he's making it clear, look, I'm not a socialist. I'm not a socialist. But I think what he's really kind of arguing is like a return to Keynesianism. Like we actually need more state intervention in the economy. He says privatization in the absence of clear and enforceable rules, however, will simply allow insiders to grab resources, which is exactly what happened in Russia, Ukraine, and many other post-Soviet republics. The rise of China and other economies in East Asia in the, in the latter part of the 20th century made it clear to me that having a modern state was the single most important institutional foundation for economic growth and much more important than democracy. So I think this is him also just kind of, I think he's doing two things with this series, acknowledging one, that neoliberalism has failed and there needs to be more state intervention, but two, also he's going to clearly going to make the argument that the deep state with some element of independence from the po popular will with, you know, an impartial modern autonomous state that is non-democratic state is also important at maintaining that stability. And, you know, we can see that there is a major economic crisis going on in the West. Now, the last thing I'll say here, I know we're going to wrap up soon. The last thing I'll say about this article that he does, which is another thing that he just kind of throws out there because it's once again him showing that he's still a liberal. He's not in any way a socialist. He says, on the other hand, we are all aware of the threat posed by strong states. And he names China, Russia, Myanmar, Tunisia, interestingly. And then, of course, Venezuela and Nicaragua. And he has this hilarious throwaway line where he's making it clear to people, look, I'm anti-socialist. He says, Nicaragua and Venezuela are ruled by strong men but have been unable to provide basic public services, which is hilarious because if you compare Nicaragua and Venezuela to their neighbors and not to like European welfare states, the social services in Nicaragua and Venezuela are way better than any of their neighbors. Obviously, Venezuela has been suffering through 
brutal sanctions and, and, and a blockade preventing it from exporting its oil. It lost 99% of state revenue. But even then, the Venezuelan government, since the rise of Hugo Chavez in 1999, has built over 4 million housing units for poor people. It provides health care and education. Nicaragua's social services are way better than El Salvador. And he talks about El Salvador as an example of a country where a weak state led to the rise of like organized crime and the Maras and gangs. So he throws in these lines that are just flagrantly false. They're ridiculous. Like Nicaragua has free education and health care. I have friends whose like parents had cancer and got all levels of cancer treatment and never paid a single cent. Like the, the healthcare system in Nicaragua is better than the healthcare system in the US. And Nicaragua is a very poor country. So it's funny that he has to throw out that red meat to like his his neoliberal friends while also saying that, you know, neoliberalism clearly is a disastrous system. So yeah, I don't I mean, know where we'll, he's we'll going with that. Yeah, go ahead. I, don't, I don't know if he's trying to like what what he's getting when he keeps talking about property rights, but then he keeps talking about neoliberalism is 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 wrong. I mean, I'm wondering if it isn't the answer. And full-on privatization isn't the answer. It's like you wonder if this is uh, kind of gearing up for the sort of great, great reset, public partner, you know, uh, pr public-private partnership kind of mode of capitalism. I mean, it's clear that they need to change things, but I think they really don't want to change to sacrifice their position in the political economy. I mean, the people that are running and owning everything right now. And so I think somebody like Fukuyama is trying to whether he's how consciously he's doing this or, or not, but seems to be laying a, the, the, the ideological framework for, for like a shift back towards a certain kind of like neoliberal Keynesianism in, in a way um, with these public, like, you know, you're talking about the, he says the privatization offered opportunities for like rent seeking and so on. Well, look at the United States. Why do we have, why are oil companies not publicly owned? They end up dominating the political system with the amount of money that they generate. Why are the railroads not publicly owned? Uh, th this is this is a huge issue uh, in, in the United States that we don't have. We have the same. We have an oligarch class that makes the Russian oligarch class seem like, uh, you know, suburban homeowners or something. I mean, the, the wealth of the U.S. oligarchy is <laughs> massive and it comes from rent seeking and monopolies like Jeff Bezos and Gates. I mean, Bill Gates is like. First, he monopolizes the personal computer industry. Then he wants to go into education. He promotes all that education privatization business, which is just another money grab, another privatization uh, of, of education. So it would operate like the military industrial complex, basically. Then he went into, then he wanted to go make all this money off of vaccines. He's a huge landowner. Bill I mean, Gates is now the, the largest landowner in the US. Yeah. So these are guys who just they they want to they they're doing exactly what he says these people in other countries do uh, in terms of rent seeking and and abusing their you know relationship with the state um, it, it, to to become ridiculously wealthy and and be politically super powerful. So there's this is what he leaves out is quite is instructive and it, we should look at this with great suspicion because uh, it seems like he's trying to build up to he and other people, the establishment seems to be wanting to have some kind of great reset, mini reset, move towards public private partnerships, maybe to deal with the fact that people are going to be broke. They'll give everyone like coupons to McDonald's or something like that, you know, rather than come up with a, a way of having good <laughs> equitable agriculture, they're going to come up with some crazy corporate way to try to deal with these issues and this may be a way to kind of butter people up for that, among other things. Yeah, there's going to be like rationing, like World War II style rationing, where you get your, you know, your card with all of your your food coupons, but instead it's for like Arby's and McDonald's and all, yeah. just to keep these companies afloat. Because obviously, if you destroy the purchasing power of your local population of workers, they can't sustain the consumer-based economy. So then you destroy your, you cannibalize your own economy. So you're going to have like public private partnerships to keep fast food corporations afloat. Yeah, I mean it'll be interesting to see where the series goes. I mean, last thought I had cuz I know um, you know, uh when I, we're going to wrap up in a second here, but uh the last thought I had just before we wrap this up is he ends the second part of the series with uh two very funny sections. He talks about his time 
for 18 years on the board of the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED. This is, of course, a notorious CIA cutout created by Bill Casey's CIA and the Ronald Reagan administration and one of the co-founders of the NED um, famously said that what we do is what the CIA did covertly 25 years ago, but we do it openly. That was Alan Weinstein. He said that in the Washington Post. But so Fukuyama was on the board of the CIA cutout for 18 years. And he said that when he was on the board, he said, I tried to argue consistently that the NED and its institutes, he's talking about the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute, they needed to focus not just on opposing authoritarian government, but in helping nascent democracies build their state institutions and deliver the goods with respect to democratic government. So he's also kind of arguing for kind of new Keynesian nation building, I guess. And I think they're, they're preparing the ground for the new Cold War and being like, look, we need to invest more in state building and in supporting liberal democracies abroad. And then what he takes this to is, uh, you know, I think where he's really taking the series, and this is where we'll continue this later when he publishes the other parts, he, all this momentum drives toward the end. And he says, after seeing the weakness of the state in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Solomon Islands and Bosnia, he came to realize that the United States suffers from its own version of state weakness. This led me to my next focus, state building inside the United States itself. So as, as I always say, you know, what the imperialists do abroad, it always comes home. The, the neoliberal structural adjustment policies applied abroad, they came home in the form of austerity. And now state building itself, which failed in Iraq and Afghanistan, as he acknowledged, now we need some state building inside the U.S. itself. <laughs> that seems to be where he's going. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it, 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 there's, there's something to be said about that. The U.S. needs more kind of New Deal institutions and so on, at the very least. And it could affect a transition to like socialism. But the thing is, they're going to do it in ways to make sure that that never happens. So like, of course, the U.S. does need to have a, a functional public state, right, that, that works in the public interest. But that's not exactly what he's really he, he's not quite getting at that. It, he's very it's very ob oblique what he's really trying to um, what, he, what he's really referring to. So the U.S. needs these sort of things. But is he really talking about like, you know, uh, more public ownership of of rev of monopoly uh, uh, or of natural monopolies? Is he talking about uh, public employment programs like something like the Civilian Conservation Corps on a much larger scale? Is he talking about debt write downs that could deliver the goods? You know, I mean, if you're talking about deliver the goods, deliver things that make the lives of the majority of the people better like they're just not going to do that because of what he others with the other part that he says is enforcing property rights which encompasses so much it means keeping a ridiculous debt overhead in place just to discipline people and even when it, it's not, even if it's owned by the government and could like for example the student loan thing could be negated they don't they don't do it because the the example it might set but the thing is they already set the example about debt and uh, you know, uh, and, and money creation being something that's quite malleable, you know, when they bailed out all the uh, financial institutions in 08 and 09 and with QE and other things. So it's like, we've got the worst of both worlds. We've got a state that's like interventionist and does disregard like the sacrosanctity of debt, but only when it's there to help the, the oligarchy uh, and for oligarchic purposes. And so um, this is not a, a, a it, he doesn't seem to be saying things that are going to get anywhere near the level of uh, critique that we need to, to deal with the, the, the problems we're facing. Yeah, well, I think that's a good note to end on. This is, uh, we're going to do this in two parts. So we're not going to keep going on forever in this series. I think we established a lot of good ground here. I'm, I'm interested to see where Francis Fukuyama takes this, but this is going to be our two-part analysis of Francis Fukuyama and his series, Valuing the Deep State. And when he publishes the final parts to this, we'll, we'll do a follow-up. But I thought it would be good to have a discussion of this today, just because I think for people to understand what these establishment, you know, bourgeois scholars are saying, who have a lot of influence in Washington, I think it, it really 
provides a lot of insight into what people in Washington are thinking in this moment. Clearly, they can see that there's an economic crisis going on across the West. This world is fundamentally shifting. U.S. unipolarity is dead. The rise of China, Russia, Iran. Iran just joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Asian integration. There's a lot of interesting things happening. And it's, it's very important to study and deeply read what a lot of these you know, uh, imperial strategists are saying. So uh, when I saw this series, I knew I had to get Aaron on. Aaron is, I've said this many times and I, it's true. I think Aaron is probably the world's leading scholar of the US deep state or in the top three uh, of the world's leading scholar of the scholars of the deep state. So I knew I had to get him on. Uh, any final thoughts before we conclude here, Aaron? No, I just, I hope that, uh, I, I guess, I hope people start to look more at like the deep state as oligarchic top-down power uh, and think about it that way and don't get sucked into like sort of believe it, the hype of the of Fukuyama and other people about the Trumpian version of the deep state, which is really kind of a cartoon. Yeah, great. Well, as always, you can support this show. This is a joint production of American Exception and Multipolarista. You can go to patreon.com slash American Exception to support the great work that Aaron does. And you can go to patreon.com slash Multipolarista. We'll be back soon for the other part of the series. And then, of course, we have the other series that we do, which is Empire and the Deep State, a history of the U.S. Empire and the Deep State based on Aaron's must-read book, American Exception. So I'll, we'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ben.